Then for the next speaker, we have Naomi Gandler from Cornell, who will tell us about the PQXFS. Thank you. Take it away. All right, thanks. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, James Ling and Mankey for the opportunity to speak here. Um, I'm going to be talking about this project called PQ Axiverse, and this is based on some work which is coming out imminently with my collaborators Mehmet Demirtis, Cody Long, my advisor Liam McAllister, and Jakob Moritz. Okay, so just to summarize what this talk is about in one sentence, um, we'll show that the strong CP problem is automatically solved by the peche quinn mechanism uh, in a large fraction of type 2B compactifications on O3, O7 orientifolds of torque hypersurface calabiaus. And by the end of the talk, I'll have explained to you what automatically means, as well as what the large fraction of compactifications is. OK, so to give you a roadmap of where we're going, um, I'll first review the strong CP problem. And then I'll explain to you the Peche Quinn solution and why the Peche Quinn solution comes with its own problem known as the Peche Quinn quality problem. Finally, I'll present to you a computation of an upper bound on the QCD theta angle in string theory and show you our results. Okay, so first off, the strong CP problem. Uh, as we all know, the QCD Lagrangian can, in principle, include a CP violating term, um, which has this form, where g mu nu is the field strength of the gluon, and theta is a real number, a parameter, which tells you how much CP, CP breaking there is in your theory. Um, and experiments on the neutron electric dipole moment give an upper bound on the theta angle of 10 to the minus 10. So the strong CP problem is simply the question, why is this number so small? All right, um, there's a few different solutions proposed to solve the strong CP problem, but arguably the most viable and the one that I'll spend all of today talking about is the Peche Quinn solution. And this mechanism involves promoting that parameter theta to a dynamical field known as an axion. Um, and QCD instanton effects generate a potential for this axion, which looks like this. It depends on lambda QCD to the fourth. It has some order one coefficient, which is in terms of the quark masses, times theta squared. And the reason this is a solution to the strong CP problem is that if VQCD shown here is the only contribution to the QCD axion potential, then the axion dynamically relaxes to zero and the strong CP problem is solved. So here's a cartoon of this. Um, I've plotted the potential on the y-axis and of course its minimum is at zero, which is below the experimental value of 10 to the minus 10. So strong CP is solved. But of course, if there's something else that contributes to the QCD axion potential, then the minimum of the potential might shift outside of the experimentally allowed range if that contribution is too large. So here's um, a cartoon of the disaster which might happen. And uh, this possibility of a term V hidden in the axion potential is known as the Peche Quinn quality problem. So, um, to put it explicitly, if this term V hidden, any contributions are less than 10 to the minus 10 lambda QCD to the fourth, then the strong CP problem is still solved. But if it's bigger than that, then you've ruined the Peche Quinn mechanism with these contributions. Um, and one point I'd really like to impress on you is that the Peche Quinn mechanism is sensitive to UV physics, even to Planck suppressed operators. Um, so, in a sense, we've traded a hierarchy problem, the strong CP problem, for another hierarchy problem, the Peche Quinn quality problem. So, you know, you, you had to pay up for solving the strong CP problem this way. Um, so, for example, an operator like um, 1 over m Planck squared times some scale that's not too small uh, spoils the Peche Quinn mechanism. And uh, to make headway on this problem, you really need in hand a UV completion of gravity because it's sensitive to Planck suppressed operators. And this is awesome for us because this is a real opportunity for string theory. Okay, so now I've explained to you the Peche Quinn mechanism in generality. Now let's talk about it specifically in type 2B. So the setup that I want to have in mind is that we compactify type 2B string theory on a Calabi-Yau orientifold. Um, no, we're not going to be engineering an explicit standard model. 
Instead, what we'll do is choose some four cycle, which I'll call DQCD for the rest of this talk, um, in the compactification manifold to host QCD via a stack of D7 brains, and then demand that that four cycle have the right volume to reproduce the known QCD gauge coupling. Um, another point to make is that we're going to be agnostic about moduli stabilization, and I'll explain a little later on what exactly I mean by this. Um, so given that you know, we're being agnostic about moduli stabilization, we're not engineering uh, an explicit standard model, what can we hope to say about the peche quinn quality problem uh, in this context? And what I'll show you is that we'll be able to put an upper bound, nonetheless, on the QCD theta angle. Okay, so um, now let's talk about the effective theory that one gets from compactifying type 2b on a Calabia orientifold a bit. So this effective theory contains H11 axions, where H11 is a Hodge number of the Calabiao, with associated Kähler moduli, T sub A is tau sub A, the volume of a four cycle plus I theta sub A where theta sub a um, is an axion, which is defined as the integral of the C4 Ramon Ramon four form field strength over some four cycle in the manifold D sub a. And the QCD axion, theta QCD, is simply one of these uh, C4 axions associated to the integral over D QCD, the four cycle that we've chosen to host QCD. Okay, so these are the axions in the effective theory, but where do they get a potential? Well, V hidden, as defined earlier in this context, is generated by Euclidean D3 brains wrapping four cycles in the manifold. So V hidden is part of the F term potential that we know and love, generated by instantons, where K here is the Kähler potential equal to minus two times log of the overall volume, and W is the super potential, which has this constant flux piece plus a sum over instanton generated terms. Um, and again, if V hidden turns out to be less than 10 to the minus 10 lambda QCD to the fourth, then the strong CP problem is solved. So this is the condition we really want to check. So clearly to check this, there's a few crucial questions. The first is what is W naught, i.e. what is the scale of supersymmetry breaking? The second is what is V the overall volume of the Clavier, i.e. what is the KK scale? And finally, what are the instanton charges QA and their associated Kähler moduli T sub A, um, i.e. what are the actions of the contributing instantons? So uh, a definitive calculation of the QCD theta angle would require, first of all, a calculation of the zero modes of the Euclidean D3 brains on all the divisors, um, an explicit orientifold, a moduli stabilization scheme, supersymmetry breaking, and an explicit realization of the standard model. And, uh, you know, this is a, a lot to ask for. Um, and maybe in a few examples or case by case, it would be feasible to, to do some of these things alone or in tandem. But we'd like to understand the behavior of the Peche Quinn mechanism in a large landscape of models. And furthermore, we'd like to understand it today. <laughs> so what are we going to do? Well, instead of doing all these things explicitly, we're going to make our assumptions maximally conservative, i.e. we're going to pick our assumptions such that they're most likely to spoil the Peche Quinn mechanism. So how will we do that? First of all, we'll assume that all effective divisors contribute to the superpotential, and more things contributing means uh, the more possible trouble for the Peche Quinn mechanism. Um, similarly, we'll assume that the orientifold doesn't project out any instantons, so more instantons, more problems. Uh, the moduli, as I said before, um, we're going to be agnostic about moduli stabilization, and uh, we'll set the moduli to be at their most dangerous values. And again, I'll come back to this in a couple slides and tell you what I really mean. Um, <clears throat> Another thing I'll talk about a little later on in, in the talk is that uh, it turns out that the Peche Quid mechanism is in the most danger when the scale of supersymmetry breaking is low. So in the interest of maximally conservative assumptions, we're going to take the SUSY breaking scale set to one PEB, sort of the lowest possible conceivable value. Um, and finally, as I said, we're not going to explicitly realize the standard model. Instead, um, we'll consider that every prime toric divisor in the Clavier uh, could be a candidate uh, to host QCD. And so for, for each Clavier, we'll consider all such candidates for DQCD. Okay, um, so 
how do we explicitly do this? So first of all, we'll choose a Calabiao. In our case, we'll choose a Calabiao from the Kreuzer Skarka database. Then within that Calabiao, we'll choose an effective divisor, dqcd, on which to host qcd. Then we'll choose a point in moduli space. Then from that point, we'll dilate the overall volume of the Calabiao until the divisor dqcd has the right volume to match the qcd gauge coupling. And then we'll compute theta. OK, so as promised, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, these points of choosing the moduli. So how will we choose the moduli? Like I said before, we want to remain agnostic about moduli stabilization. So what we'd like to imagine is that um, the moduli could get stabilized at any point in the moduli space. So we don't have a specific scheme in mind. In fact, they could be stabilized pert perturbatively. Um, our approach is rather going to be to find a statistical upper bound on the QCD theta angle within the moduli space. So find the point in the moduli space where the theta angle is largest, and then declare that an upper bound on the theta angle within the moduli space. So that's what I mean by we want to choose the moduli to be at their most dangerous values. So to get a feel for this, um, let's go through a cartoon example. So here's a moduli space. It's a Kähler cone, so it's the moduli space of the Kähler parameters. And what we're imagining is that there's some locus inside the moduli space where the volume of the QCD divisor gives the correct gauge coupling, i.e. gives the correct um, alpha sub s, fine structure constant for QCD. Okay, so ideally what we'd like to do is uniformly sample this locus and compute theta at each point. Of course, this is not computationally feasible. So instead, what we'd like to do is calculate theta at the point along this locus where it's going to be the largest. Um, so to figure out where that point should be, let's uh, right now compute theta at a randomly selected one of these points in a toy example, and then we can figure out which point along this locus we should be using in a large scan. So let's take you know, this point, for example. Um, and suppose that at this point, instanton contributions make the potential um, seen here, where we have one piece, which is our familiar lambda QCD to the fourth theta QCD squared, but we have some additional piece generated by Euclidean D3 brains that goes like lambda hidden to the fourth times cosine of the axions. Then we can compute the theta angle. It's simply lambda hidden to the fourth divided by lambda QCD to the fourth. And because this additional piece is generated by Euclidean D3 brains, we know that lambda hidden to the fourth is going to go like e to the minus 2 pi times volume of some divisors. So what we'd like to do is pick the point in the moduli space along this locus where divisor volumes are going to general, generally be the smallest. So that's a point more like this one, right? And we can get at this point by performing an overall dilatation of the Calabiao, starting at a point um, known as the tip of the stretch Kähler cone. So this is the point in the Kähler cone where all curve volumes are greater than or equal to one. Um, I should say that this is not a, a proof that this is the most dangerous point in moduli space. So we haven't performed an optimization, but as you'll see momentarily, the physics conclusions that we're able to draw from this are not going to be sensitive to this being the precise point in the moduli space where divisor volumes are minimized. Um, and one more crucial piece is that um, at this point in the moduli space, we'll further condition on the volumes having, uh, or sorry, on the divisors having volumes greater than or equal to one as well, i.e. we want to be in the geometric regime uh, where the alpha prime expansion is under control. Okay, so now that we've chosen a point in the moduli space, we should ask ourselves, what could spoil the peche quinn mechanism? So there's two effects that might shift the minimum of theta outside of the experimentally allowed range. The first is that of high-scale QCD instantons. So these are instantons which have their zero modes lifted by higher dimensional fermionic operators, and they contribute a piece to uh, the axion potential um, shown here where here mu is some high UV scale, and phi um, is a, a phase. It represents some order one CP breaking in the UV. And what one can show is that QCD instantons contribute most to the theta angle when the scale of supersymmetry breaking is low. 
So assuming that there's no vector-like matter, the contribution to the QCD theta angle from high-scale QCD instantons is roughly 10 to the minus 13 times TeV cubed over M Suz cubed, uh, which is less than 10 to the minus 10, the experimental threshold value. And just to comment for a moment on this assumption of no vector-like matter, um, that's what I'm going to be assuming for the rest of the talk. But we have done the analysis um, for effective theories with some vector-like pairs, and I'm more than happy to discuss it afterwards. It does change the story um, slightly in an interesting way. So this uh, explains why I said earlier in the talk that we're going to take M. Suzy to be one TEV because we want to put the peche quinn mechanism in the most danger. So we're choosing the scale of super, supersymmetry breaking to be as low as conceivably possible. All right, I told you there's two effects that might shift the minimum of theta. The first was high-scale QCD instantons, and the second is hidden sector axions. So these are axions which get their potential from so-called stringy instantons, or Euclidean D3 brains, wrapping other cycles in the compactification manifold. So if these cycles are small enough, then these instantons can also shift the minimum of the QCD theta angle. And one simply has to check in each Calabi Yau if they do. So that's what we went and checked. And to sort of uh, spoil the main results, um, what we find is that for H11 bigger than about 25 with no vector-like matter, um, the contribution of stringy instantons to the QCD theta angle is less than the contribution of high-scale QCD instantons to the theta angle, which, as I showed you on the previous slide, is less than 10 to the minus 13, i.e. the strong CP problem is automatically solved. So um, now I really want to show you our results. Remember, the goal was to compute an upper bound on the QCD theta angle in a large set of calabi yau compactifications of type 2b string theory. And the search space for us will be 15,000 calabi yau manifolds obtained as triangulations of 1,500 for the reflexive polytopes with H11 less than 150 randomly selected from the kreuzer skarka database. And if you're wondering why I picked this number 150, uh, it's not because we don't have the capabilities to go higher. Um, we could go all the way up to 491 if we wanted. It's just that, as you'll see in a moment, the pattern is so clear that there's really no need to do that. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to show you some, some dots now, but I want to set the stage a little bit instead of just throwing a bunch of dots at you. So um, I want to take you through some relevant um, regions in the parameter space and scales. So on the y-axis, I'll be plotting theta. Um, so this will be our upper bound on the QCD theta angle. And on the x-axis is H11. Um, and there's two regions on this plot I want to draw your eye to. The first is the region above 10 to the minus 10, which is the region excluded by neutron EDM experiments. So the fact that the neutron, that the theta angle has not been detected to be in this red region is the strong CP problem. And the second region, which I haven't talked about it all yet in this talk, um, uh, is the fact that there's actually a contribution to the theta angle already from the standard model. So there's CP violation in the weak interactions, and these produce a contribution to the QCD theta angle of uh, about 10 to the minus 19. So that's what this region is here. And the reason I'm plotting it is because there's this interesting little band between the red region and the blue region where one could hope to detect a neutron EDM. So one could hope to detect a theta angle in that band. Um, okay, now I'm ready to show you the dots. Here they are. So each dot on this plot uh, represents a model. So each dot here represents a choice of calabi -Yau, and within that calabi -Yau, a choice of QCD divisor. Okay, And uh, these red dots are the total upper bound on the theta angle. So remember, these are made from two pieces. They're um, the contribution of stringy instantons to the theta angle, plus the contribution of high-scale QCD instantons to the theta angle. So that's what's shown in red. And in blue, I'm showing you just the contribution from stringy instantons, so just the contribution from Euclidean D3 brains wrapping other cycles in the compactification. Um, and the main point of this plot is that, as you can see, for low H11, there's plenty of models um, where the upper bound on the theta angle that we compute is very high, 
in the excluded region, and so those models are excluded. But what's cool is that you can see that um, the contribution of stringy instantons dies off very quickly. And so for H11 bigger than about 25, you see that the, that the uh, neutron EDM is dominated only by the high-scale QCD instantons. The contribution of stringy instantons is totally suppressed. Um, and so the strong CP problem is solved. Now, the, the y-axis here is like a huge scale. <laughs> so maybe you're not uh, convinced or maybe you can't see that closely that those red dots really lie outside the excluded region. So let's just uh, zoom in here. So let's zoom into this region. Um, and when we do that, we can see clearly that the red dots, which are upper bound on the total theta angle, uh, lie several orders of magnitude below the excluded region. Okay, cool. So that's the main result. And at this point, I should probably address the elephant in the room, which is that these red dots lie in this uh, interesting band that I told you about, where one could possibly hope to detect a theta angle in the lab. Um, now that sounds very exciting at first glance, um, but let's bring ourselves back down to Earth. And remember that these are the points calculated when the scale of supersymmetry breaking is 1 TeV. So when the scale of supersymmetry breaking is very, very low. And these points get lowered as uh, you increase the scale of supersymmetry breaking. Um, so one of the main takeaways is actually this link between the scale of supersymmetry breaking and the theta angle. And in particular, what this plot is suggesting is that if the scale, if supersymmetry is right around the corner, then so is the detection of the neutron electric dipole moment. Yeah, I mean, you've got five more minutes. That's great. I'm on my conclusion slide. So to uh, just conclude, the Peche Quinn mechanism to solve the strong CP problem is generically threatened by high scale, even Planck suppressed operators. Um, but in string compactifications, we can calculate these effects. And we've done so in type 2b compactifications on toric hypersurfaces. And what we found is that in the geometric regime for H11 bigger than about 25, the strong CP problem is almost always solved. Um, one thing I didn't have time to say, but uh, which was a really fun aspect of this project and I'm happy to answer questions about or, or talk about later, um, is that in these effective theories, so in each one of the little dots that I showed you on the previous slide, we also checked the cosmological and astrophysical bounds. And what we find is that they're often satisfied. So um, bounds on the dark matter relic densities of uh, axion dark matter um, and astrophysical bounds coming from uh, axion photon couplings, um, those bounds don't automatically rule you out. And it's, it's interesting to look at how, how they play with this story. Um, so finally, for the future, some things I would love to do is to have better constraints on uh, axions from observations. Um, I, definitely, we should do more explicit realizations of this story, because maybe there's some things hiding there that weren't clear from doing you know, a, a broad uh, search. And finally, um, we want to uh, analyze the Peche Quinn mechanism in other corners of string theory. Thank you. All right, let's thank Naomi for the very, uh, very nice talk. And uh, we have some questions. Jim? Hi, Naomi. Great, great talk. I have two fast questions, and I promise they'll be fast. Okay. The first, when you did the uh, relic abundance calculations, is, is, it, is it vastly undersaturating in general, the relic abundance? Um, uh, is it is it far yeah. below the observed amount of dark matter in, in your plots? I can show you. Sure. <laughs> uh, so so this is actually the plot of yeah. of the relic abundance. So on the y axis yeah. is the ratio of the yeah. abundance yeah. of dark matter yeah. to um, the rest of it. Uh, and so yeah, sometimes it's it's. Uh, well, it, it, it's, it's never like super undersaturated. Sometimes you're ruled out. So that's what those red regions are. But, right, I see. But, but it seems like sort of the takeaway is that in general, for most of these, you're, you're well, the axi QCD axion is not the dark matter. Um, my, my, my other question just to be, so I've been excited about this paper for a while that you guys have coming out. I was hoping that the result would be that uh, 
you know, um, basically that solving the problem requires going a ways out in the stretch Taylor cone in general at relatively large n. I think what you're saying is sort of the opposite. The, the reason I was excited about that is it potentially gives a selection mechanism for large volume and weak coupling, which really we don't have in string theory generally. That, that solving solving the the, the uh, strong CP problem would require going to large volume and weak coupling. I think you're basically saying as long as H11 is bigger than 25, you just don't have to. It's it's, it's automatic. Um, would, it, is that right? Well, yeah, but there definitely is some truth in that statement. So one thing that um, will be in will be in the paper that I haven't had time to talk about today because the analysis isn't complete is that you can ask um, how this story goes through if you don't condition on stretching the divisors. So you don't condition on the divisor volumes being bigger than one. And uh, I, I don't want to speak too soon because, you know, we have a lot to think about, but it seems like the story could be changed there. And so maybe there is some version of what you're suggesting, maybe just not as extreme that you need to go very far out in the stretch Kähler cone. I see. But but so for H11 is 25 and above, it's satisfied at the tip already. It's not like you have to go way out. Uh, well, it, it's not. Yes. So our starting point is the tip of the stretch Kähler cone, but then we dilate the overall volume to match right. the QCD gauge coupling. So um, it is further out in, in the Kähler cone just because you need to go further out to match the volume of the QCD divisor to the QCD gauge coupling. Okay. All right. Does that answer your question? It does make sense, and I'll let other people ask questions. Thanks a lot. All right. Then let's move on to Ivano. Or... Yes. Hi. Hi. Thanks for the very nice talk. I was intrigued by one of your last comments about the relation between the scale of supersymmetry breaking and the theta angle, right? Yeah. Uh, so uh, um, there are some recent papers in the context of the Swampland program in which they, the authors argue that high uh, scales of supersymmetry breaking are, uh, are consistent, whereas, you know, essentially you cannot go parametrically low with the supersymmetry breaking scale. So there seems to be an interesting, uh, you know, um, overlap with, the, with what you said about higher scales give uh, theta angles that are more compatible with the, with the strong CP problem, if I understood correctly. Well, it, it is true that the theta angle, the, the upper bound on the theta angle that we calculate decreases as you push up the scale of supersymmetry breaking. But one of our conclusions is that even at the lowest possible uh, supersymmetry breaking scale of one TeV, so it's you know just around the corner, about to be detected, um, even there we're finding that that the strong CP problem is automatically solved for large enough H11. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, then next, Irene. Sorry, Lang. Less. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Naomi, for the for the talk. It's super cool. So I want to make sure I understand the, the plot that you have of the theta in terms of H11. So here, yeah. So the reason why you get the horizontal line is because you are fixing the QCD contribution and then the stringy contribution is becoming very small. So that effectively the result is like a horizontal horizontal line, right? Yes, the only thing that I would change about that statement is that we're not fixing the we're, we're, we're not saying let's impose that that the high scale QCD instantons give this contribution. Um, that's just the result that one gets if you take the scale of supersymmetry breaking to be one TV. But yeah. Okay, so it will be a horizontal line, but you are not fixing where the, horizon, the horizontal line is, right? That's the point. Exactly. And you know, like, yeah, you said that it goes down if supersymmetry breaking is higher. How fast? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know, if I put supersymmetry breaking at 10 to the 16 GV, you know how low yeah, is so the... it goes down, yeah, it goes down like M Susie cubed. Okay. Yeah. Cool. And just the last thing very quickly. So sometimes you said, that you are assuming that there are no vector-like matter. Mm -hmm. Why does it yeah. matter? What, what changes? Yeah, so it matters because if you have vector-like pairs, then that changes the beta function of QCD. Mm -hmm. So when we do the, the process of matching the volume of the QCD divisor to the QCD gauge coupling at low energies, we need to know the beta function to be able to do that RG flow. Um, and so if you have some vector-like pairs that changes the beta function and um, changes the story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Okay, no, thank you. It's super cool. All right, Leng. Yeah, uh, thank you, Naomi. So um, you made a comment in the beginning um, that uh, this is uh, somehow relating uh, to effects of quantum gravity. But I just wanted to ask if you had something more concrete in mind in this particular instance or this particular quantity that you can compute, uh, where can you pinpoint, say, what exactly is that there like a dominant effect of quantum gravity? Or is it maybe just like some local yes. gauge dynamics on seven brains uh, wrapping divisors? Perfect. Thank, thank you for the question. So I actually, I meant to say um, when I was talking about these high scale QCD instantons that that result, so in effect, this horizontal line that I'm showing here, this is just a result from, from QFT. This is just a gauge theory result, right? So that line alone has nothing to do with string theory. Um, however, one has to check whether the actual stringy effects, so Euclidean D3 brains wrapping other cycles in the kalabi whether those um, have dominant effects. And what we're seeing here is that for low H11, so with a small number of axions, the, those stringy effects do dominate, right? So that's all these uh, dots above, in the excluded region um, for small H11. But what we're saying is that very quickly in H11, those effects die out and you're dominated just by the, the, the gauge dynamics. So just by um, the contribution of high scale QCD instantons to the theta angle. I see, okay. Does that answer your question? Uh uh yeah yeah i mean so so the string effects uh, is that is that um so my point is in what sense are they gravitational other than just the fact that you know they they come from maybe other divisors other than your gauge divisor is is that the sense in which you know they they, they are mediated by some gravitational interaction can uh, like from an eft perspective if, if you want to tell someone who does know string theory, why this is a gravitational effect, right? These stringy guys. Mm -hmm. So how would you argue for that? Yeah, okay, thank you. So so I wouldn't say that, that the uh, couplings between these uh, parts of the story are gravity mediated. It's that from compactifying string theory, we see that there are mixings uh, between different axions. So the uh, effective theory that you end up with has, um, you know, H11 axions, but they can appear as linear combinations in cosines in the scalar potential, right? And it's the fact that um, they can mix inside the cosines that tells you that they're, um, that, that, they, that they can pull on the QCD axion. I see, okay. All right, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Right. Thanks a lot. Um, then let's wrap up, wrap up today. And thanks Naomi and Pietro for the very nice talks. And thanks a lot.